Welcome to Asian American Life. I'm your host, Ernabel DeMillo. In this edition, we'll take a look at healthcare workers who are changing the way we receive treatment during the pandemic. We'll also take a look at doctors on the front line and meet one mother who is raising awareness on Lyme disease. Now, here's a look at what's ahead on our show. Mind, body, and soul. Reyna Ramirez reports on the doctors who are helping patients one note at a time. Kyung Yoon meets the medical expert who is changing urgent health care. Plus, our latest report on why Asian Americans are still getting stuck on the corporate ladder. And Minnie Rowe explains what we need to know about this tick season and Lyme disease. This and more on Asian American Life. When Dr. Kathy May Tran is not on the front lines of Mass General Hospital in Boston, she turns to her viola and meditation from the French opera Thais. For a few months now, music has been part of her practice. I see a lot of pain and sadness and sickness and illness in my work. And every day when I leave work, that's what I bring home with me. With the song, every time I play it, I pour everything I have into pulling the notes out and making the shape of the music. And then when I stop playing, it, it, feels, it feels like a release. Dr. Tran has been treating COVID-19 patients at Mass General Hospital in Boston for more than a year. Like many healthcare workers, what she's seen is beyond words. Sometimes, I feel the burden of expectation that we're supposed to be superhuman, that dealing with sickness and illness and death is something that we should be able to do. And that's not true. Every person who is transferred to the ICU, every person who passes away, that's a person that we carry inside of our hearts. This return to music, has been my oxygen. Tran is part of the Boston Hope Music Teaching Program, a pilot collaboration between the New England Conservatory of Music and Mass General Hospital. The idea is simple. The program pairs conservatory musicians with frontline healthcare workers for private music lessons. I'm able to kind of channel those bad energies and focus on something that is creative and productive. Tran hadn't played in 10 years when she dusted off her viola for lessons with Luther Warren. And then you have a lot of room when you go back, then you can do all those. The best way for us to, to deal with traumas that we've experienced is to find a ray of hope and beauty. Music as tonic is something Dr. Lisa Wong knows about. She wrote a book, Scales to Scalpels, a reflection on the healing arts of music. And for two decades, she served as president of the Longwood Symphony Orchestra, an ensemble made up entirely of medical professionals. When the pandemic shut down live concerts, the Longwood Symphony Orchestra went virtual, delivering performances to patients in hospitals. The easy thing was just to put everything online and on YouTube and let everybody access it. What we really noticed was how impactful the music was to the caregivers who were themselves traumatized from all of this. And again, thinking about how veterans are traumatized, then we said, well, how can we treat or, or offer, offer healing to the caregivers themselves? The answer, virtual lessons with virtuosos. And what began organically was given backbone. Teaching fellows at the New England Conservatory were trained on trauma-informed therapy to help deal with the needs of healthcare workers. We talked to them about how this is uh, music education not for helping somebody go on to play in Carnegie Hall, for example, but it's really for the purpose of helping people to reflect and giving them an opportunity to have the gift of music. 
Warren, a violist at the New England Conservatory, says teaching frontline workers anchored him as a musician in uncertain times. To be given a chance to use my work to help those that are doing the work at the front lines, I think that's really powerful, and that by itself is very inspiring. When Tran picked up the viola back in the fall, she had a particular song she wanted to learn. Okay, so meditation? Meditation from Thais was, um, was my mom's favorite song. When Tran plays meditation on the viola, she draws her strength from her mother, Wei Tran. A lone refugee from Vietnam, who scrambled for two years to come to the U.S. A single mom, she worked as a hotel maid and then earned her nursing degree, raising two children in rural Georgia. Growing up in the Deep South as an Asian American is a very isolating experience. I had my mom, I had my brother, but other than that small support system, I didn't have a lot of people who understood me and I didn't have a lot of places to share my thoughts and my feelings. And um, music was a way for me to do that. When colon cancer struck their mother six years ago, she and her brother Tom turned to music. We held her hands during her last minutes. And when she passed away, I was in shock. I didn't know what to do. But I remember that my brother, he stood up and he walked to the violin and he picked it up and he played meditation for her. In the Vietnamese culture, we have an annual remembrance ceremony. So every year we have a ceremony for my mom. Every year, meditation is a song that my brother plays for her. In December, Tran performed meditation in honor of her mother. Even if there are things out of my control, it's giving me an energy to go on and to continue what I'm doing and to, to help as many people as I can help um, as much as I can. In February, Dr. Tran and Dr. Wong played a duet at the historic Ether Dome at Mass General Hospital in time for the Lunar New Year and to share their joy of the Boston Hope Music Teaching Project. For Asian American Life, this is Rainer Ramirez. When the COVID-19 pandemic broke out last year, it created a new normal of face masks, hand sanitizers, and social distancing. And for one medical company, it put a new urgency into urgent care. Dr. Richard Park, an emergency care physician, is the founder of CityMD. He says when he opened the first office on the Upper East Side in 2010, there was no grand strategy, only a simple philosophy. We were pathologic patient pleasers. And so, you know, we, um, we really wanted to serve our patients. And I think it came from that heart. And so as part of that, which ended up being really good for patient care was to make everything about the patient and make their lives easier. How do you serve someone? Today, CityMD is the largest urgent care company in the metropolitan New York area, with more than 135 locations in New York and New Jersey. Park says growing up in Flushing, Queens, as the son of Korean small business owners, ingrained in him the spirit and grit of an entrepreneur. I was born here in the States, but my parents being Korean and immigrated to the States with very little opportunity other than to open stores and to do retail in New York City back in the late 60s and 70s. Um, dinner table talk around the kitchen or a dining table when we did have dinner was about, hey son, look at all the stores we're going to open, look at that retail space. Wow, if we could only get that lease in that location, oh, how good would it, it would be like heaven for this family. Park attended Stuyvesant High School, but after getting accepted to the University of Pennsylvania, he deferred college for a year. 
To earn money for tuition, he opened his first retail store, a one-hour photo shop on 83rd Street and 2nd Avenue in Manhattan. So you were young when you started your first business. What were some learnings from that that went into CityMD? So as a physician, but having had that Korean retail background, to sign a store lease, put up shingles, and open up, um, whether it's a one-hour photo or one-hour medicine, that CityMD really became to be, um, that fearlessness, because that was just natural to you. That's what you did. That's what everyone did. Number two, because you're caring for being on that side of the counter, the service counter, most of your childhood and adult life, you're always serving the customer. Even as a college student, Park shuttled back and forth from Philadelphia to New York City every week to help his family run the photo store, which by this time had moved to a new location at 77th Street and Lexington Avenue, across from Lenox Hill Hospital. One of his customers was a medical doctor who would change his life. Dr. Bert Bell, the late Dr. Bert Bell, he was a customer and he uh, convinced me to go into medical school. So I followed him around Jacoby Hospital, and this is a time when I'm in college, not knowing what I want to do. I was a business major at one, and uh, ended up applying to medical school because of Bert Bell and going to Albert Einstein, where he was a professor at. Park says even after becoming a medical doctor, he never forgot the lessons he had learned running a retail store to provide convenience, quality, and customer service. He says it's this patient-centric approach that makes CityMD stand out. Many doctors feel, I, I guess, a little bit um, more privileged than, than they ought in this relationship. And so it's always about the customer. And I think that certainly had an impact on the ethos of CityMD. So everything from the, the ground floor retail office to the glass, to being able to see the end of the hallway to the very back, low counters and unrestricted access for the patient to the staff. It's that entire mindset permeated everything we did. And so even without having to dictate, it just sort of came to be so that you make it easy for the patient. But it was during the COVID-19 pandemic that CityMD emerged as an important and accessible testing destination for patients, with its locations in every borough of New York City and suburban New York and New Jersey. What was the impact of COVID on CityMD? Yeah. So, Chung, I have to say COVID was a really, uh, a really proud moment for CityMD really proud for all of us involved. It was also uh, really a very trying time for the staff as well. So our staff um, were heroic, absolutely heroic. They're working seven days a week, nonstop, number one. Number two, it was a proud moment because we uh, were able to fulfill what we were built for. And at CityMD, we were, first of all, serving kindness and not just in the Upper East Side, Upper West Side, but um, about 25% of our patients are Medicaid. CityMD merged with Summit Medical Group in 2019, and Dr. Park has since moved on from being CEO, although he still remains on the board of CityMD. He's gone on to start a healthcare fund with a mission to provide capital to help the most vulnerable people, including the elderly and those living in poverty, gain access to healthcare. I'm Kyung Yoon for Asian American Life. The rise in anti-Asian hate is hard to ignore, but there are more subtle forms of bias that play out in corporate America. Did you know that of all the CEOs in the Fortune 500 companies, only 12 are Asian American? A new book from CUNY professor Margaret M. Chin looks at why Asian Americans are stuck on the corporate ladder. I wanna bang the drum this morning. Rishi and the traders will be in shortly with their axes. Double sales credits to anyone who fills them this month. Our world view today is what we own and what our traders own. This scene from HBO's drama Industry is a rare sight on screen. Actor Ken Leung plays Eric, an Asian American boss in a corporation. In real life, Asian Americans are just as rare at the top of corporate America. Of the Fortune 500 CEOs, only 12 are Asian American. That's just 2%. I think that was one of the biggest thing that hit everybody. People just didn't know. Margaret M. Chin is a sociology professor at Hunter College. 
and the author of Stuck, Why Asian Americans Don't Reach the Top of the Corporate Ladder. A lot of people who may see Asian Americans as competent, but they're not trusted, is that they're seen as outsiders. Chin interviewed more than 100 Asian American professionals, including seven chief executives, who agreed to speak with her anonymously to protect them from backlash. They shared a common theme of encountering unconscious and blatant bias. There's a lot of xenophobia in the U.S. that a lot of Asian Americans are categorized as an outsider, as being foreigner. The assumption is that you're not really American. There has been an increase in um, not only outright violence against the Asian American community um, and those appearing East Asian, uh, but then it's also taking place, you know, um, in a workplace environment. And the, the way that it plays out there is that, you know, they've you hear people say, you know, I don't want to sit next to that person because they're they're Chinese. Serena Fong is vice president of strategic engagement at Catalyst, an organization promoting the advancement of women in the workplace. There have been instances where. I've been told to, I mean, it's to any, anywhere from be the note taker to go get somebody coffee, to hold somebody's coat. They all, these little acts um, all add up to where you do feel that you're on guard. To get to the C-suites, what the seven Asian American top executives had in common was a matter of trust. It means that they have to get to know the people in their executive committee. And they also had to let the executive committee get to know them. And I said, well, what does that have to do with trust? And they said, well, they have to know me for who I am. Yes, I'm Asian American. Yes, there may be a lot of people out there who are Asian American, but they have to know me for who I am as an authentic Asian American. That the challenge may be around narrative, how to tell your story, Grace Niwa is Vice President of Talent and Executive Search at Vertex Pharmaceuticals. She says what she looks for in a leader is authenticity. Um, knowing yourself, your strengths and weaknesses, being able to speak to it in a way that doesn't feel like you're boasting, but telling a story um, is essential. A lot of the Asian Americans who have made it to that level, they actually see themselves as, I have to explain myself. I have to be authentic as an Asian American. And that's the value I bring to the top of the corporate ladder. Chin is hopeful that the barriers being broken in the executive branch of government marks a paradigm shift in the U.S. and the beginning of more representation of Asian Americans and people of color in executive suites. But while I may be the first woman in this office, I will not be the last. For Asian American life, I'm Rainer Ramirez. I'm Minnie Rowe. Spring is here, and that means many of us are heading to the great outdoors. But before you go, one Asian American mom turned tick expert wants to warn you about the dangers lurking outside your door. She has a website with practical information and dispels some of the common misconceptions about ticks. Gloria Kim never ventures outdoors without first applying tick prevention spray. My son was on a charity hike in November. He was playing in the woods. Eight at night, around 11.30 at night, he woke up and he was itching his underarm and the back of his ear, and he had ticks on him, and they had latched on. In 2006, her oldest son, Brandon, was nine years old when he contracted Lyme disease after he was bitten by an infected tick. I had heard about ticks, but I really didn't know anything about them. So we actually took them to the emergency room and we had them um, removed. We were told by the physician we saw that he most likely wouldn't have Lyme disease or any other sicknesses because he had the tick on him for less than 12 hours. When the ticks she sent away for testing came back positive for Lyme, Gloria said she knew her son had Lyme, but couldn't convince any doctors to agree with her. It took a year to finally find a Lyme literate doctor to treat her son, during which time her once active, bright-eyed son rapidly deteriorated in front of her eyes. So it started with like headaches. He had trouble with his vision. 
so much pain. Right. His knees, his joints, his muscles, he gets spasms all the time. And the only reason why he'd sleep is because he would pass out from the pain. Lyme disease is an expanding epidemic. Dr. John Ockhart is with Johns Hopkins Lyme Research Center and calls it the number one vector-borne disease in the country, with nearly half a million new cases a year. In 2020, roughly 2 million Americans suffered from chronic symptoms related to Lyme. It started in the three foci on the West Coast, the Great Lakes region, and New England, and the expansion over the last 40 years has been quite dramatic. When a tick bites a human, bacteria travels from its gut to the salivary glands and into the skin over a period of several days. Those squiggly lines inside the feeding cavity are Borrelia burgdorferi, the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. Contrary to popular belief, the bacteria doesn't come from deer, but from mice. Ticks feed on deer just before they lay eggs, and so the deer act as a food source for the ticks. While the bullseye rash is a warning sign, it's not present in all cases. Antibiotics are an effective early treatment for Lyme, but left untreated, symptoms can progress into something much worse, as in Brandon's case. Over the years, his illness took a heavy toll. Gloria's marriage broke up. Her other children lived in fear of losing their big brother. I was getting calls from the school and the teachers saying like, Sophia's crying. She's afraid Brandon's gonna die. I'm sorry, it makes me upset. <clears throat> and we'd have the same issue with Aiden. And just for them to constantly go through that. And the whole time we were thinking he was going to die also because we didn't know anyone who was treating him properly. Over the years, Gloria had amassed so much research trying to help her son that she created a website called Limiting Lyme to help others navigate the confusing Lyme world and amplify the need for more funding. According to the advocacy group Center for Lyme Action, Lyme disease research amounts to just $63 per person as compared to research for West Nile virus at $13,600 and malaria at almost $119,000 per person. We need people to write their Congress people just so we can get more funding, so we can nip this in the bud. In the meantime, Gloria says the best defense against Lyme disease is not to get bitten in the first place. So prevention is key. Gloria uses DEET or Picardin on her body and treats her clothes, socks, and shoes several times a season. Once sprayed, the effects last up to four to six washes. And don't forget about your furry friends either. They can also bring ticks into your home. Every time you let that pet out, they're doing their business and like, in grass and maybe tall grass next to a tree. There could be a tick there that's gonna latch on to you. Don't be lulled into a false sense of security that ticks are dormant during winter months. My son was bit November 6th and there was, there was snow on the ground before that. So he was fully dressed in winter clothing and a hat and he still got two tick bites. Ticks aren't just off trails in the woods. They can be in your own backyard. Remember, mice are the carriers of the bacteria that causes Lyme, so ticks can be found anywhere where mice tend to breed. Gloria even found one in this tiny patch in her New Jersey home. In your yard, you should cut the grass short. You might want to consider calling someone to maybe spray your yard. If you have any playground sets for your children, they're away from any types of long grass or the woods. If you do find a tick on you, don't panic. Take a sharp-tipped pair of tweezers. Get as close to the skin as possible and pull straight up. Then put the tick into a container with a moist paper towel and mail it to a tick testing facility. And then you go like this and you send it off in the regular mail. While none of this can help her son Brandon, who is still suffering 14 years later with debilitating ailments, Gloria hopes her story will help others who may find themselves in her shoes. 
He can't walk around the block anymore because it gives him too much pain. His knees hurt him. He gets muscle spasms all the time. The way I look at it is I'm like saving lives. And if I can do that and not go through what I had to go through with my son, then, then, that, then I did something. Then I did something good. Make sure you check yourself too when you come in from the outdoors. Ticks like warm, dark places, so check under your armpits, behind your ears, and along your hairline. And don't forget about your pets either. Rub your hands through their fur, check behind their ears and their collar, between their legs and their tail. I'm Minnie Rowe for Asian American Life. Good boy. That's our show for now. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to learn more about our stories, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Asian American Life. I'm Ernabel DeMillo. We'll see you next time.